Today on BRS TV, we're gonna cure your fish. Hi guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. This week we're going to discuss treating illness or parasites that can attack your fish. There's a reason why this is at the end of this series and that's because in many ways this is one of the final frontiers of reefing. Fact is you really can't bring your sick fish to the vet so you need to develop some of your own veterinary skills if you run into one of these issues that threaten their lives. It is a bit nerve wracking to give direct advice on fish illness because even with the best advice, the success rates for someone who's doing this for the first time is maybe less than 50%. Basically, you need to be able to spot that something's wrong, which is difficult to the untrained eye, diagnose the cause correctly, which is often difficult, and then implement the proper treatment option. All this is not only hard, but in many ways intimidating, and if done wrong, can make the problem worse. To add to the difficulty, there's a healthy amount of inaccurate and anecdotal information out there on the best treatment methods possible and how to properly hospitalize your fish so you have to muddle your way through that debate when you're having an issue. In this case, my best advice is listen to the pros, meaning fish disease research scientists and intelligent engaged people who handle a tremendous amount of livestock like fish store owners, fish wholesalers, or aquaculture facilities where they've all treated these diseases hundreds of times and survivability means pro profitability. I found several blog or forum posts I'm going to reference today which include information I feel to be accurate. The first is stages of a marine Aquarius experience with parasites by Snorvish, a moderator on Reef Central. He starts with the risk of offending some folks, which I'm sure he and I will by sharing this information, but I agree with what he's saying and there's a handful of stages that every hobbyist goes through in relation to treating and protecting their fish. Starting with what some may consider harsh words with unconscious incompetence characterized by the following thought processes. All tanks have Vic. There's nothing I can do about that except feed garlic or ginger. I can't afford to quarantine. I'll just have to hope for the best and buy from good stores. I only buy from local fish stores that will hold the fish for me for two weeks so I don't have to quarantine. I buy fish from local fish stores that run copper in their system. I only get fish from reliable friends. I always freshwater dip all the fish I purchase and I always drip acclimate every fish for two hours. If you stay in the hobby long enough or experience some fish mortality, the natural progression is to what he refers to as conscious incompetence, where a reefer might be more aware of the issue but still not dealing with it appropriately. Meaning I know the parasites exist, but with proper feeding, the immune system of the fish will fight them off. When I purchase fish, I get them right out of the bag when the local fish store gets them in to avoid additional stress for the fish, but I drip acclimate for at least two hours, and again, I buy fish only from local fish stores that run copper in their system. Next stage he suggests is unconscious competence characterized by I always quarantine for at least a month but I don't treat the fish unless I see something wrong. And then maybe 1% of us make it to the final step of conscious competence, meaning I always put my fish through tank transfer, follow up with a month of observation, and treat twice with Prozzi Pro. I know basic behaviors associated with fish parasites and no treatments available for each. I keep an arsenal of treatment options for parasites, flukes, and bacterial issues. I quarantine everything wet added to my aquaria. The fact is the only way many people are going to get to that last stage is through failures and experience. While many reefers may be wise enough to learn from others' mistakes and skip a step or two, the fact is most people won't go down this path until it's either emotionally or financially in their best interest, meaning that they've had some pretty devastating losses and they're not going to go through that again. Now there's a lot of reefers out there saying that I never did any of that stuff and I've never had an issue. Well some of us are just lucky, others might just not be aware that they've dealt with this stuff already because they didn't notice the signs and the dead fish just seemingly disappeared. Most of those fish could have likely been saved if the issue had been spotted. I know each member of the BRS team has a different story to that effect. Some lucky, some not so lucky. I know that Zach and Nick now take tremendous pride in their ability to prevent, identify, and treat fish illness because they constantly save lives in their own takes as well as others with their direct advice. And saving these fish is something to be proud of. So with all that said, today we're going to share what the BRS team collectively does when we need to treat for some of the most common issues with ick, brook, and velvet, which I think is going to cover 70 to 80 percent of the issues that average reefer is going to run into. So if you can identify and treat these properly, you're on a good path. 
The first element is spotting there is an issue. One of the most common is the fish stops eating. Loss of appetite or desire to consume life-sustaining nutrients is a pretty big sign that something's seriously wrong, which applies to almost all of the animal kingdom and certainly applies to most fish. This is why it's critical to ask the store to feed the fish before you bring it home. Eating doesn't mean it's safe. It's more of a method of ruling out the unsafe. If it doesn't want to eat in the store, it's warning you that you're putting your other pets and wallet at risk by bringing this home. There are a variety of reasons why the fish might not eat, and not all of them mean they're sick, but at the very least, they're highly stressed, which makes them prone to sickness. There are ways to make the food more enticing so they do eat and get the calories or energy required to maintain proper metabolic function and fight the illness. I know that when I'm sick, a bowl of soup or a smoothie is a lot more appealing than a stick of broccoli or a salmon dinner. But keep in mind, even if they do start to eat, which is good, this hasn't solved the underlying issue with the illness. There's also obvious visual signs, which if caught early can be very beneficial, but if you wait until it's covered the entire fish, it might be too late. A couple examples are common white dots, powdery look, thick slothy residue in the fish, open sores or even faded color are surefire signs that something's wrong. There are also behavioral cues like labored respiration or gasping, scratching themselves in the rocks or even laying restlessly in the sand. Since treatment for all the underlying diseases are different, it's pretty critical that you make the correct identification before selecting a treatment. Let's start with common ick. Identifying ick generally begins with behavioral signs like flashing or scraping themselves on the rocks. After that, it progresses to visible signs of ick with tiny white salt-like grains on the fish clamping their fins next to their body, followed with loss of appetite and finally labored respiration or gasping as it overwhelms the fish's gills. So naturally, your success rate of treating the fish is going to depend largely on where did you identify the issue. If you didn't notice the issue until the fish is gasping for breath, it's going to be too late in many cases. It's also common for the fish not to die from the ick itself, but from secondary diseases, parasites, or wounds related to the weakened immune system. So when do you treat ick once you've identified it? Well, everyone has opinions on this ranging from the very moment you notice a single sign of ick, it's time to quarantine and treat the entire tank, to only treating the individual when they show a serious sign of distress from the ick. I think to some degree they're both right, depending on the circumstances. And this advice ranges from what I refer to as best practice versus what's realistic in most cases. If you're a pretty advanced reefer and religious about your quarantine methods when adding anything wet to the tank, I think it does make sense to remove all the fish and treat them if you see any signs of ick in the tank because it's the only way to truly eradicate ick from the system, which despite what many people believe is likely possible with the right methods and procedures and what I would call best practice. I will say keeping a tank truly free of ick requires knowledge, scientific diligence, close attention to contamination prevention procedures, and a level of effort that just isn't realistic for the average aquarium owner. But the commonly thrown around theory that it's impossible to have a tank that's truly ick free isn't accurate either. Ick isn't magic fairy dust that comes into existence on its own. It's a protozoa with a known life cycle which is fairly easy to disrupt and completely eliminate. If that's done properly, an increasingly large portion of the more advanced reefers are accepting that a truly ick-free tank is likely very possible. I think a lot of the debate comes around the fact that while possible, it isn't probable because either the approach is flawed or there's an error in procedure which contaminates the tank. You not only need to quarantine and treat every fish that enters the system, but also every coral, snail, or really anything wet that enters the system for a pretty prolonged period of time. This just isn't realistic for a vast majority of aquarium owners. So here's the thing about ick. It's present on a large portion of the fish in the ocean and probably fair to say that most fish have been exposed to it at some point in the ocean and ick doesn't seem to cause serious health issues there. Mostly because as part of its reproductive life cycle it drops off the fish, multiplies itself and later bursts into new protozoa that need to go find a new host. The ocean's a pretty vast tank of water and in most cases the fish's immune system can defend against this low level threat. In the aquarium, this can be very different because it's a pretty small closed system and it's possible for the sheer numbers to overwhelm the fish's natural defenses. Some fish tend to be more prone to this than others, particularly those with a thinner slime coat, like a powder blue tang. So that said, ick is one of those things that can be present in the tank and visually not be an issue, even at higher ick population densities. Even though you don't see visual signs, the ick's life cycle is likely surviving inside the fish's gills, but the immune system has been successful of keeping it off of the body. 
So this can go on almost indefinitely, or at least until an environmental factor or some other stress impacts your immune system. So it might seem like ick went away on its own, and there's no visible signs of ick. Your fish are still supporting the ick's natural life cycle, and it's most likely still present in the tank, just biding its time, waiting for the right moment. Really the only thing that's keeping all of this at bay is the fish's healthy immune system, which means proper diet, clean, unpolluted environment, and proper husbandry. Proper diet meaning paying some level of attention to the fish's natural diet and attempting to get those elements incorporated into what you feed. Everyone has their own strategy for this, but I've had the best luck with clean, unaltered mysis shrimp like the Canadian mysis from Akari or Piscine Energetics. PE mysis comes in cubes, which I think most people will prefer over the slabs, but that's just a personal preference. In conjunction with that, I feed Hikari Seaweed Extreme pellets, which are 67% seaweed. Some people prefer nori, but I find these easier to feed. Fish like them a lot, and there's one less reason to put my hand in the tank. I also have some specialized fish with unique diets like the twin spot gobies which do pretty poorly with standard fish foods in like 90% of the cases. We feed them a combination of Akari cyclopods and PE's frozen Kalanis. The PE Kalanis is a bit larger and if I could only feed one it'd probably be that one. The twin spots are not only surviving but rapidly growing with this food target fed to them every morning. One last piece on proper diet, there's a lot of people out there that suggest feeding garlic to treat or prevent ick or really any other sickness and there's a lot of foods that contain it because of that. I honestly don't know where this originated and I'm sure even I've probably mentioned this as a potential helpful component at some point, but honestly the more I read about this the more anecdotal and unlikely it seems. In fact there's some pretty significant potential health issues associated with garlic. It might be valuable in enticing a fish that won't eat to go after food, but there's a hundred different foods or other additives that can do that as well. There's more information on this topic than I can possibly share today, but in general, I'm going to recommend not feeding garlic at this point. It's probably not a solution and likely causes fish harm. If you'd like to learn more about this, I would check out Humaguy's post on Reef Central called Humaguy, Synopsis on the Efficiency of Garlic in the Marine Fish. For reference, he's a fish disease research scientist that specializes in fish parasite infections and vaccination, and considering his opinion on the topic is a good use of time. In relation to environmental factors, a clean, unpolluted environment is a relative term since they're all in a small closed system and more or less swimming around in their own filth. We can improve on that with a proper water chain schedule, equipment like a skimmer, filter sock, roller mat, or even promoting biological solutions that break down waste like carbon dosing. Well, there's no real measurement of water cleanliness. I think that nitrate levels are about as close as you're going to get to that. For me, the NIOS test kit has been the best kit I've used to measure nitrate. In close relation to that, a stable environment with limited alkalinity, temperature, and pH swings are going to promote a healthy immune system, proper husbandry, more or less not overstocking the tank, which can be the number one stressors of fish, which are particularly territorial on either habitat or food sources, tangs being one of the most susceptible. So if you add a fish and get an ick outbreak, it was just as likely that it wasn't because the fish you added had ick, it's because the ick was already present in the tank, and adding the fish provided the stress required to suppress the fish immune system and allow the ick to take a foothold in the system. So more or less paying attention to what's realistic in most cases over absolute best practices. If you spot signs of ick in your system, it's going to be the BRS team's advice to not move every single fish out of the tank and treat them. In fact, we're not even going to recommend that you immediately treat the single fish either. We're going to recommend that you focus hard on maintaining a proper diet, stable water quality, parameters, and husbandry. Then pay very close attention to the fish and monitor the progress. If you start to see a significant amount of ick on the surface of the fish or it stops eating, it's time to capture and treat the fish for sure. If you start to see light signs of ick on a majority of the fish or significant signs on multiple fish, it might be time to capture them all or just those affected and treat them as well. Keep in mind that treatment is stressful as well, so there's a risk with every decision. I'll say that in a vast majority of cases, if ick is a widespread issue in the tank, the issue is more often than not related to a serious issue with the tank's water quality, stability, or a major husbandry issue. So I take a close look at these elements, or you're probably going to have an ongoing problem until you do. If you do need to ultimately treat your fish, there are three methods that work consistently. You'll need to capture the fish and then move them to a hospital tank where they can be treated with hyposalinity, copper, or the tank transfer method. I'd say most of the staff here has historically relied on the copper, but the tank transfer method has become more popular and with good reason. 
Most of us have learned what we know on this topic from a forum post at one time or another, so I'd like to reference another good one by Snorvich, which is a sticky in the fish disease forum of Reef Central, Marine Ick, the real scoop. The first part of the life cycle is probably the most important to understand. More or less, the ick has four stages of life. One where it feeds directly on the fish. Second, a few days later, it falls off and settles in the sand. And then enters the third stage where it attaches to the substrate. Once it attaches, it divides itself into hundreds of new parasites, eventually hatching into free swimming parasites, which seek out new fish to attack and start the cycle over. An important note in all this is there's only a few days of the cycle when the ick is actually visible in the fish, so the untrained eye be easy to assume awesome feeding, garlic, or just time beat the ick, but in reality it just fell off so it could multiply itself by several hundred times. The same post also has a good reference to some of the common treatment options that work, starting with hyposalinity. Using a refractometer, hold the salinity at 11 to 12 parts per thousand for four weeks after the last spot was seen. Raise the salinity slowly and observe the fish for four more weeks. It's difficult to control pH and water quality during this treatment. However, this is the least stressful treatment for the fish. The copper treatment, follow the medication's recommendations. This can be effective in two to four weeks of treatment. After treatment, remove all the copper and observe the fish for four more weeks. Copper is a poison to the fish and creates some stress. The tank transfer method, the fish is moved from tank to tank to separate the fish from the cysts that fall off in the free swimming stages of the parasite. Two hospital tanks are needed to perform this treatment. The fish will be stressed by having to keep moving it between these different hospital tanks. There's also a super helpful list of his observations on common claims and myths. There's a lot to be learned from some of the fish illness authorities in relation to that. If you click on the blog entries link next to Snorvich's name, you can find some other really cool information, including a link as to why he advocates for the tank transfer method on all new fish. More or less by moving the fish every few days, you let the ick fall off and form the cysts on the rock or sand, and then move the fish to a new tank before they hatch, which breaks the reproductive life cycle. This is typically done for a total of 12 days, whether it be three days, four times, or even two days, six times. Nothing's completely infallible, but there's a very strong likelihood that you've completely eliminated the ick from the fish with this method. He also combines the last two stages with Prozzi Pro, which eliminates the other hard to spot parasites. End of the day, Snorvich obviously seems to be a strong advocate of treating fish for common illnesses with the assumption that they have them, rather than just observing and putting the rest of the tank at risk. So what if you have a serious outbreak, want to treat all the fish and virtually eliminate or at least drastically reduce the chances that you'll ever deal with ick in the future? My best advice is remove all the fish, leave the tank fishless for at least two months, and let all of the ick hatch and starve to death. Tank transfer all your fish accordingly during that time, and then quarantine every new coral and snail for two months before adding to the tank, just in case they have an ick cyst on their base. You want that to hatch in the fishless environment and starve. A few of you are thinking, oh sweet, that's the solution. I can't wait to implement a zoo quality quarantine system and list of processes. But most of you are thinking, are you insane? That's way too much work. I don't have the space, time, or money for that. Well, open and honest, I hear you, but I think the only space in between these two extremes revolves around dumb luck or just keeping your tank stable, clean, and feeding a healthy diet, which keeps your fish's immune system in good shape. Okay, moving on to Brooklynella, often referred to as Brook or Clownfish Disease. I'm not sure why clowns are more susceptible to this disease, but it's the most common fish to be affected by this. However, it can be in a wide variety of fish, and once it takes hold on one, it spreads rapidly to all the fish in the system. The biggest issue with Brook is catching it in time. The fish will often look hazy, cloudy, or have a thick mucus coat, which looks like the skin is slothing off. They lose color, the fins are clamped at their sides, listless and easily caught. So here's the deal, from the time you notice it to mortality is often hours, but almost certainly within a day, so it's time to pick a path and act. The reason it's so aggressive is because it attacks the gills, they fill with mucus and they often suffocate. The treatment method I've seen consistently effective is formalin, which I believe is a mixture of formaldehyde and alcohol and sold under some aquarium brands. I think I'd look for a straight formalin, but Akari sells a product called IC-X, which is a mix of formalin and malachite green, which might work if that's all your fish store has and you're in a pinch. Treatment normally consists of dips in a stronger solution and then a bath in lower concentration for a couple weeks. As to when and who to treat, that's simple. At the very first sign, remove every single fish, assume they're all infected, and you have pretty minimal time to save all of their lives. 
Fact is, unless you're a pro at this and have all the tools ready, the first fish to show signs of Brook is probably doomed. If you wait for the others to show signs, they'll probably join him, but you have an opportunity to save them if you act quickly. The formaldehyde dip is pretty aggressive and not surprisingly pretty hard on the fish. If the fish is already almost a goner, the dip might be too much for them. It might be best to just skip the dip and hope that the lower dose bath is going to help. This is why it's important to dip them while they still look healthy and can tolerate the medication. I have to say your first attempt at this might be a complete failure, but you might just save a few fish or at least be better prepared for next time. The real issue is when did you recognize you had the problem and how fast were you able to acquire the formalin? Frankly, if you had to think about that last step, it was probably too late. These medications are like 10 bucks, so a wise reefer will go out and buy them right now. And just keep them on hand to protect their pets and investment. If you don't have any formalin around at the moment, a freshwater dip will often buy you some time, but won't solve the issue. I'll tell you that if you do save them successfully, there's a tremendous amount of satisfaction in not only knowing what to do, but able to effectively apply it in a way that saves the lives of all your pets. Like I mentioned earlier, you are your tank's veterinarian. Very similar to Brooke is Marine Velvet. In fact, in many ways, the life cycle is actually also very similar to Ick, but in the late stages, the visual symptoms may be closer to Brooke in some ways. It certainly is similar to Brooke in that you need to catch it fast, and you need to treat all of the fish in the tank. Like Brooke, you also need to keep the tank free of fish for a couple of months to prevent reinfection. Early symptoms will be behavioral with scratching on the rock, swimming slowly, and not react as quickly to things like the net or your hand, and you may notice them breathing rapidly. After that, you can sometimes notice ick-like white spots and a gold dust which has a velvet-like appearance. For the most part, I think you need to identify it here and treat quickly because the later stages happen rapidly and the survival chances are fairly low. Like Brooke, Velvet also attacks the fish's gills aggressively and you'll see a thick slime coat on the fish as well. Sadly, treatment for Velvet isn't as agreed upon as other parasites, but it's absolutely treatable and it seems a variety of treatments work well. Zach either uses copper or malachite green. Ick-X claims to be effective on velvet and uses a mix of formaldehyde and malachite green. There's also an Ick-X salt water, which is just formaldehyde and probably not the one I would use. HW sells a product called Odinex, which is the only product that I'm aware of that is specifically marketed to treat velvet and primarily copper, but typical to German products, there are some mystery additional elements in there which are designed to help specifically with velvet. Again, Snorvitz has a pretty solid article on Reef Central where he recommends a freshwater methylene blue dip and then a formalin bath. He also mentions that many people do treat with copper, however, keeping copper at the proper level is very difficult and infeasible for most aquarists. That's a difficult issue to address. You really should be testing for copper when treating with it to produce and maintain the right concentration. But there are different types of copper with chelated and free ionized copper. And sadly, some of the copper-based products don't interact well with other additives or medias you might be using. You really need a good test kit for this as well. A skater and other super helpful RC moderator produce a pretty awesome sticky on drug interactions in the fish disease treatment form as well. If you haven't caught on yet, there's a wealth of information in this forum and one of the best places to evolve your new home taught reef tank veterinary degree. If there's one piece of advice I can give everyone today, it's take a trip to your local fish store and buy yourself a bottle of formalin and some type of copper so you're just ready in case you ever need it. Then come back and thank me the day that you use it. If you have a few extra bucks, pick up an antibiotic, malachite green, methylene blue, and some Prozzi Pro as well. Last week we asked all of you what your worst tank disaster you've ever had was, and not surprisingly, temperature related was the winner, just followed by power outage. This week we're asking all of you, what is the most important medication to have on hand at all times? So hit that I in the upper right hand corner and vote. If you have any questions, check out the comments area down below. Give us a quick thumbs up and subscribe. See you next week with week 52, tank upgrades and a close look at where the BRS-160 is today.